All set. Well, thanks so much, John. And thanks to the Proud Alliance for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I see some familiar faces there. I'm happy to see everyone. And also welcome to Mary Cohen, who uh, I've worked with in the prison choir that she's actually the director of the prison choir that I'm gonna be speaking about a little bit. Um, and perhaps I should define a few terms since we have people here from outside the Proud Alliance. Um, Neo-humanism is a, is a word that I use in my title. The, the title almost sounds like a setup to a joke. I think a neo-humanist walks into a prison, but um, it's actually a, uh, neo-humanism is a way, I would say it's a way of being in the world that encourages and allows you to expand the circumference of your concern and compassion and love to everyone you come into contact with. Uh, there's more to it than that, but that's a basic uh, description. And then Prout is the progressive utilization theory. And one might say that that is a practical application of neo-humanism. It's, uh, it's a theory that uh, works to uh, create a more just economy, a more just society where everyone can express their full potential. Uh, it's a vast subject, and if you're not familiar with it, there's a lot of material online that you can um, look into. So I thought the way that I'd structure the evening was that um, I would talk a little bit about my experience as a volunteer in the prison. And as a way of doing that, I would read from my book, which is called Redemption Songs, A Year in the Life of a Community Prison Choir. I'll do that for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I wanna share a song that was written and performed by an insider, a man incarcerated in the prison, which is quite a moving song. And I think it will give you a sense of um, the work that we were doing. And then uh, moving from the personal, you can say more towards policy. Uh, I prepared a um, PowerPoint presentation which deals more with um, research-based information about the prison system in the United States and some uh, policy suggestions in, in terms of thinking as Proutists uh, about this particular issue, how we would go about structuring uh, policy in a society that was uh, inspired by Proutist principles. Uh, and then after that, um, I'll open up the floor and we can have a conversation. We give um, questions and answer time um, and any comments that people may have. So I'm gonna begin uh, by reading a little bit from my book. I, um, I spent seven years volunteering in the Oakdale Community Choir. And as I mentioned, Mary Cohen is here. She was the director of the choir. And I'll just jump in and uh, give you a sense of what that was like. Every Tuesday afternoon for six of the last eight years, I've driven or carpooled the nine miles from my home in Iowa City to the adjoining town of Coralville, where the Iowa Classification and Medical Center at Oakdale, a medium security men's prison is located. To get there, you pass a sea of townhouses lining the interstate corridor and at the mega mall exit, turn north onto Highway 965. The prison rises from amidst the sprawl of commercial development on the edge of town, a set of institutional buildings you might drive by without really noticing. Jockeying out of rush hour traffic and into the parking lot, I ease my car into a space near the main administration center. A giant American flag whips high in the breeze in front of the building next to an Iowa flag and a Department of Corrections pennant. Bumper stickers on the cars of volunteers and prison staff offer mixed messages. God bless everyone, no exceptions. Out of Iraq now and stop global whining. I'd slide my driver's license across to the muscular correctional officer sitting behind the front desk. He flips through a box and pulls out my visitor's badge, which has my name and photo on it. I take a seat with the others 
until it's time to line up and move quickly through the halls. The volunteers gathered here are part of the Oakdale Community Choir, a performing chorale made up of 25 to 35 men serving time and 25 to 30 community members, both men and women. For an hour and a half each week, we grapple with a range of choral music, mustering breath and will and vocal cords, preparing for two concerts at the end of each season, one for inmates in the prison, the other for the public, also held inside the prison. The work is demanding, but it's also rewarding. As volunteers wade through the challenges of making music in this circumscribed environment, we gain glimpses into what life is like inside. At the orientation before the beginning of my first season in the choir, a prison official walked our group of 15 new volunteers through the basics. Remember, he said, no open-toed sandals, sleeveless shirts, shorts, skirts above the knee, tight-fitting clothing, or hooded shirts, sweatshirts are allowed inside the prison. He made the protocol clear. Passing through the corridors, we were to walk close to the wall and pay attention to our surroundings. Potential danger, he warned, lurks around every corner. Never let a prisoner walk behind you. As if to put our understanding to the test, we were taking on a tour. Fluorescent lights flickered down the corridors, reflecting off shiny floors, and the scent of pine salt lingered up to the next set of sliding doors. We shuffled past the cafeteria with its rows of institutional tables, past the cavernous gymnasium, waxed floor and dangling basketball hoops, and ended at the processing lockup where prisoners are corralled when they first arrive. Our group was mostly silent, drinking in the atmosphere. All along the route, men in t-shirts, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes, and a few, if medical conditions warranted less restrictive clothing, in gray sweatpants, stared at us. Most wore their hair short, although a few had longer hair. Friendly curiosity flickered in some eyes, while other men's faces remained stony. In the lockup, men peered at us from small rooms through tiny glass windows. They'd been in prison for only a day or so, or maybe only a few hours. I thought of the way mugshots tend to capture subjects in off-kilter, disheveled, unsmiling po poses. These men seemed to be in a similar state of shock. A few stared without averting their gaze. What lay behind the guarded vulnerability of those eyes? Did these men recognize the pain they had caused others? Did they understand the pain they themselves were in? From this, this distance, there was no way of knowing. Ushered away down the long halls toward the freedom of the front door, I couldn't help but wonder, what was it, apart from those inches of glass and concrete that separated me from them? This is a space full of people who have committed serious crimes. If you were to buy into the narrative offered by some of the mass media, those living here were unfeeling, unthinking, dangerous people, men geared towards violence and opportunism. Why not put them away and forget about them? Fairly quickly, I began to see that not all or even most of the people I met in prison were like that. And after several seasons in the choir, I feel more at ease each time we move single file out of the checkpoint and past the guard room where groups of prisoners are engaged in discussion. The inside singers are already gathered in the room. Most of the guys who've signed up to sing are white, as are the majority of volunteers. But two or three African-American men and a couple of Latino men have joined the group. Prison authorities frown on physical contact, but many of us have come to skirt this restriction, shaking hands, even occasionally patting each other on the back. I say hello to an older white insider I'm friendly with, a stooped man with a grizzled beard. How's your health? Still ticking, he shrugs, his hands in his pockets. Under normal circumstances, when you meet someone, there are a whole set of questions designed to facilitate the getting to know you process. Where are you from? What do you do? What have you been up to these last 10 years? <clears throat> Excuse me. These questions are more or less out of bounds in prison. The outsiders don't ask about the crime that landed a person here or about their sentence 
And the insiders are definitely not supposed to ask where volunteers live, what they do, or anything about their personal lives. So especially in the first few rehearsals of the season, we fumble for topics of conversation, engage in a little bantering between moments of rehearsing, searching for a light mood, trying to puzzle out some meaning we can share, a peg to hang our mutuality on, the sweep of our lives rolling silently behind us. I find a seat in the back row between Everett and Bert, two older white guys. Bert's white beard and hair mark him as one of the oldest members of the choir. His eyes twinkle and he has a clear, strong and exceedingly high tenor voice. Everett is a large man with glasses, a paunch and an interesting backstory. As I said, I don't know a lot about most people in here, but about Everett who likes to talk, I've learned a bit. For example, he grew up in Iran, son of a Texas oil man, and he speaks some Farsi. The two are fond of each other. Bert says of Everett, he grew up in Iran and Texas, so he didn't get much of an education. To which Everett replies, yeah, I think you need to be a tenor, 10 or 12 miles away from me. They laugh at each other's jokes, though they've heard them before. We form a circle around the perimeter of the room. The director of the choir, Dr. Mary Cohen, steps onto the podium. Associate professor of music at the University of Iowa, she brings a light touch to this work, cracking silly jokes, moving and gesturing big, drawing on a natural high-pitched energy. She begins by leading us in the song, May You Walk in Beauty. May you walk in beauty in a sacred way. May you walk in beauty each and every day. May the beauty of the fire lift your spirit higher. May the beauty of the earth fill your heart with mirth. May the beauty of the rain wash away your pain. May the beauty of the sky teach your mind to fly. People have created accompanying gestures, lifting their hands into the air at the word higher and clasping them over their chests at fill your heart with mirth. As we watch each other across the arc of the circle, these movements seem to increase our feeling of community. Bert, Everett and I, grooving on the tune, spontaneously lean our heads closer together, searching for tighter harmonies as if we were in a barbershop quartet. Bert shoots for the high notes, his pure tenor soaring above the rest of the choir, providing a canopy of sound. Everett takes the melody and I aim for a mid-range harmony. Our voices intercept and then balance each other, teach your mind to fly. As we finish, the three of us, giddy with the effort of close harmony, glance at each other. Then we burst out laughing in delight at what music can do. I'm going to share um, one of the, uh, the beautiful aspects of the choir was that there was also a songwriting component to it. And many of the men wrote wonderful songs, which we performed in concerts. I'm going to play a recording of um, one of the songs that we performed by a man named Arnold. Uh, let me see if I've got this. Can you hear it? Does it sound okay? Yeah, okay. I'll just let it, it's, it's a few minutes. I'll let it run. We all face some trials and tribulations in this life. I just want to let you know to be encouraged. It doesn't matter whether you're in prison or whether you're free. Keep your head up. Check this out. I am so much. Then this number on my ID, I am so much. Then your excuse not to like me, I am so much. Then this charge to my conviction, I am so much. 
Then all your negative predictions, I am. So much. Then the title of offender, I am. So much. Then last place on your agenda, I am. So much. Then just a neighborhood felon, and I am. So much. Then just a victim of the system, I am. So much. Then you lay down letter, and I am. So much. Then the pill line oppressor, and I am. So much. Then just a human, your dog, you see me, I'll be your child of God. That's why the choir you're singing so and I am so much, so much yes I am so much yes I am so much now check this out I am yes I am so much yes I am so much you see I'm so much listen you are then a victim of rape and you are so much then a random sex mate and you are so much then your thoughts of defeated and you are so much then a child that's mistreated and you are so much then the label of thug and you are so much then your addiction to drugs and you are so much then a petty gang member and you are so much then empty bottles of liquor and you are so much then all your late night cries and you are so much. Then your thoughts of suicide you are so much. Then just a human they dog when I see you I see a child of God That's why the choir sings so Cause you are so much, so much Yes you are so much, so much Yes you are so much Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. But isn't that a a moving, uh, beautiful, um, so thoughtful song? Uh, I hope you could hear the lyrics. Um, I, I, it moves me to tears when I when I hear that song. Um, I'm gonna move from if, if if you have questions about the choir, et cetera, I think we'll fold those into all the questions at the end of the the session, but I'm going to move from this more personal uh, experience into the more research based part of the presentation. Let me see if I can share my screen. And I need to bring that up. Okay, can you can you see the 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 uh, PowerPoint? I'm going to put it into. Um, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Put it in the slideshow mode. I thought maybe it would get rid of the photos on the side. Um, the right slideshow here. should open up a menu where you can start the slideshow. Yeah. Oh, right, right, you are. Thank you, my teacher. Okay, so there we go. I'm still getting um, people's images on the side. I don't know if you all are seeing that. No, we're seeing okay. just your presentation. Great, 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 great. Okay, thank you. You can get rid of that if you want, but uh, you know, the, it's up to the individuals whether they want to keep the pictures. I'll put it off to the side there. Okay, so this this presentation is based on uh, the article that that John Linkard mentioned um, towards formulating a policy on uh, a proudest policy on prisons and uh, and justice reform. Um, so I, I I excerpt what I thought were some of the more salient and important points for this presentation, and I'll just walk you through. Um, so I am not able to, let's see, not able to advance the, um, the slideshow. What am I doing wrong? There we go. Okay. 
that's that's the book that I just read from. Um, if if anyone's interested, I can hook you up with a copy. Um, yeah, for some reason, I'm pressing the down cursor and it's not automatically moving the slide. I think if you just click on the image, it should go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Maitita. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about causes of incarceration. There are more than 10.35 million people imprisoned throughout the world. According to prisonstudies.org, the world prison population has grown by almost 20% since 2000. The female prison population has increased by 50%. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so how, do, how do I go back? There we go, sorry. In the same period, compared with an 18% increase globally for men. The countries with the highest rate of incarceration as percentage of population are the Seychelles, Turkmenistan, Cuba, El Salvador, and the United States, which I think is a very interesting uh, statistic. This is uh, a, a I would say a typical prison in, in, uh, in a developing country. The US locks up more people than any other country in the world. In 2017, US federal and state prisons housed over 2 million people, or 1.6% of the adult population. The US has 5% of the world's population and has created 25% of the world's prisoners. It's kind of staggering when you think about it. According to researchers, the immediate causes of the incarceration epidemic include the growth of drug laws, which punished minor drug offenses with major prison times. And the, the, the history of that is quite interesting. You may know that, that Clinton was um, one of the major factors in uh, creating a boom in prison population in the 90s and a Democrat. Zero tolerance policing, mandatory sentencing laws, which have prevented judges from exercising discretion. Prosecutorial zeal plays a role as well. And common challenges for parolees, like missing appointments because of lack of transportation or housing, being unable to pay fees. This means thousands go back pointlessly to prison. A 2015 study from the Brennan Center for Justice shows that prison really played no role in plummeting crime rates over the past 13 years. Certain social factors instead have led to dropping rates and aging population changes in income. That study even showed that high levels of incarceration can increase future crime because people get further criminalized and hardened when they're put into this kind of environment. Historian Robert Perkinson notes, by herding together edgy individuals against their will and enacting daily rituals of subjection, even the best prisons tend to foster more conflict than cooperation. We come to private presence, prisons. Roughly 8% of US prisoners are housed in private for-profit prisons. It's here that capitalism encounters the injustice system. The insidious thing about for-profit prisons is that they need to make a full house to make a profit. And so they require the municipalities in which they're built to keep arresting and incarcerating people. Meanwhile, their executives lobby Congress for tougher crime policies. I don't know if you can read the, uh, the cartoon, give me your tired, your poor, your illegal aliens yearning to breathe free. And this is GEO, one of the largest for-profit prison 
developers. Private prisons tend to avoid taking sick and elderly inmates since healthcare is a huge expense. And on average, inmates in private prisons serve two to three more months of time. The implication being that private prisons work to hold on to their inmates longer. Post-release, people released from prison or on parole face a whole new set of challenges, including difficulty in finding housing, jobs, and other services. Most job applications ask you to check a box if you have a felony conviction, and many employers will throw out the application when they see that box checked. There is a movement called Ban the Box, which has taken hold in many states which uh, is working to, to get rid of that practice, uh, but it's, it's not in every state. Parolees are also not allowed to have contact with others on parole, but if people close to you have convictions, it can be hard to maintain ties of family or friendship, ties which ordinarily could help you to stay clean. Finally, only 38 states restore voting rights to felons after completion of a sentence. Inmates, inmates face all sorts of terrible health issues. A Department of Justice report notes that in 2011-12, half of state and federal prisoners and local jail inmates reported having a chronic condition. Dementia is increasing due to an aging inmate population and so that contributes to uh, the number of mentally ill inmates. Although I would say that mental health uh, is kind of a crisis, no matter the age uh, that you're speaking about in prisons, there's a lot of uh, mental health uh, uh, trauma and illness. Putting people in jail and prison became the state strategy for dealing with a health crisis created by drug use and dependency. 75% of mental health cases involve substance abuse. 19% of adult inmates are illiterate and up to 60% are what is called functionally illiterate, that is lacking the literacy for coping with most everyday situations. In contrast, the national adult illiteracy rate stands at 4% with up to 23% functionally illiterate. illiterate. For African Americans, the criminal justice system serves as a gateway into a larger system of permanent marginalization, says legal scholar Michelle Alexander. Our contemporary justice system, Alexander claims, rivals Jim Crow, the post-Civil War system of laws designed to hold Black people back, which gave rise to a period marked by lynching, and other forms of violence against Blacks. Disproportionate incarceration rates are a major problem. In the US, Blacks make up 12% of the over, overall population, but they are 37% of the prison population. African Americans are no more likely to use or sell drugs than whites, but they're made criminals at much higher rates for doing so. All this is happening in the context of ongoing police brutality toward people of color. And I'm sure we could speak for, for many hours on this, on this topic, uh, the intersection of race, poverty, incarceration. Trauma. The degree of trauma people in prison have faced can be astonishing. Stories of absent, alcoholic, or emotionally abusive parents are common. Drugs, witnessing a homicide, witnessing or experiencing natural disaster, witnessing or, or being sexually abused. So-called adverse childhood events can actually change the cellular structure of the brain. Says UK researcher Paul Wren, research findings relating to young offenders show a history of maltreatment and loss in up to 90% of the sample population. 
What about the other side of the equation, the victims of crimes? The harm done to victims, long lasting and traumatic, hovers over many of these cases. And I believe it's vitally important to recognize victim experiences in the overall criminal justice story. As volunteers in prison, we have to acknowledge the seriousness of many of the crimes that landed people here. And make an effort to address the needs of crime victims at the same time, including restorative justice initiatives that bring their voice to the table and offer emotional counseling. So uh, circling back to the title of my talk, um, here's a little bit more about neo-humanism. Any proudest policy must be rooted in an understanding of neo-humanism. This philosophy sees all human beings as having the potential for growth in every sphere of life and as inherently capable of relating to one another through the lens of compassion and well being. Environment, of course, is key in this. It may be that some people are born with glandular defects or predispositions disposing them toward negative behavior, but even these people can, with time and patience, move toward more positive outlooks. For those who have imbibed a criminal mentality, reformative healthy environments must be provided to help them change their behavior. And we'll get into more specifics of that a little bit later. So here's a little diagram about neo-humanism uh, showing that, uh, showing the more limited sentiments like attachment to one's race or religion or class, and then uh, expanding out a little bit further, humanism is attachment to one's own species, the human race. Neo-humanism not only uh, expands our sense of concern to all other human beings, but then it also expands it, our love and respect to plants, animals, all beings, animate and inanimate in the universe. So uh, it's a very ecologically based philosophy. So we come now to the founder of Prout. His name was Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, P.R. Sarkar. And the next few slides are based on quotes from him and his ideas about justice. Sarkar takes a global view nesting justice reform into the larger project. He says, I am personally of the, of the opinion that since flaws will always unavoidably remain, no matter how good the judicial system, it is not the intent of nature for one human being to penalize another. Moreover, he writes, the act of punishing often leads to a feeling of, vind of vindictiveness in the minds of those administering the punishment. All should, such actions should be corrective, not punitive. Quote, if a system of corrective measures is introduce, introduced, a person who is definitely guilty will benefit from a system of corrective measures. And even a person who is not guilty will benefit from such a system. Far greater damage would be done if an innocent person is penalized because of a defective judicial system. Capital punishment, his view. The system of capital punishment is unacceptable from the moral viewpoint. It does not contain any corrective measures and has no purpose other than to instill fear into people's minds. Sarkar believes a program of work and reform is the best approach. The state will have to see to it that it receives suitable work from the incarcerated and this is my aside, it raises the question of fair compensation for working insiders. And after the completion of their sentence, the state should sincerely make arrangements to find them employment so that they will be able to earn an honest living. The situation of the defendant's family must also be considered so that they do not fall into a life of crime absent the breadwinner. Prevention is better than cure. A quote again, civilized people today should be more interested in preventing base criminal propensities from arising in human beings in the first place than in taking corrective measures to cure criminals' mental diseases. All right, I see the time is moving along, so I'm gonna 
maybe expedite things a little bit, just to note that many uh, systems around the world are more organized around the ideas of resocialization, whereas the US system seems to be organized around retribution. Uh, there's the example of Norway's prison, Halden Fengsel, uh, which has is designed to encourage stability. There's a lot of sunlight, fresh air, dynamic security, the inner relation, personal relationships between staff and inmates are the primary factor. You can see a picture there of, of the Halden prison. They cook, uh, they're allowed to cook food for themselves. Guards and inmates eat and play sports together. When conflicts erupt, other inmates and chaplains sit down with them and mediate. This is also very interesting. The Norwegian Correctional Service, and this echoes what Sarkar was saying, makes a reintegration guarantee to all released inmates, securing them a home, a job, and access to a social network. One promising trend is the development of restorative justice initiatives. These focus on the process of accountability, helping them, helping people understand the impact their behavior has had on others and responding to that harm. Bruce Kittle says, the engaged and inclusive process transforms people and they in turn transform their communities and eventually the system, not top down, but building from the foundation of a community up. Just a note about neuroplasticity, how it's, uh, the brain is very plastic and it's never too late to reprogram it in a sense. What we practice, we become. It holds tremendous potential for people with addictions, particularly. Uh, one program that is showing a lot of success in prisons is the Alternatives to Violence program. It runs workshops by trained volunteers introduces conflict resolution skills, anger management, communication, and cooperation. Unfortunately, many in many American prisons, arts writing and other remedial programs are being cut back substantially. This is to see the bottom quote. Prison systems, we're hearing from the public and politicians that we needed to hurt inmates, not help them. Uh, many, many people in prison have been traumatized by the educational system. Research has shown that higher education programs in prisons can significantly reduce recidivism. Sentencing reform must be a part of any shift to a more humane system. Legal scholar John Fath writes that there are three main causes of prison growth, unregulated prosecutorial power, structural political failures, and overlong punishment of people convicted of violent crimes, too long sentences. He believes prosecutors have, that's the, the largest factor. So what we need really is mercy and true justice, a blending of compassion and reason. And this is at the heart of neo-humanism or what are required in any correctional system, not simple blind procedural fairness. The fact that many defendants cannot afford bail, for example, perpetuates a cycle of poverty and jail time. Uh, I'll move on just to mention Greg Boyle's written a great book about working with, with people in gangs. And he also writes about expanding our circle of compassion. So people in prison need engagement in pro-social activity, creative expression, the modeling of positive emotions, retraining of the brain, resilience, all these things can help them to grow. They also need practical skills a basic education, job skills, and a post-release plan. This is very important. Prison activist Maya Shenwa writes, we see prison as a solution to the problem of crime. Instead of preventing crime by allocating resources for healthcare, early childhood education, food, housing, other basic needs, we're sending people to prison. Uh, strong communities can reduce crime, but high rates of incarceration tear those communities apart. Uh, a few, few remarks on, on the abolitionist movement. Uh, Miriam, Miriam Ankaba writes, our current historical moment demands a radical reimagining of how we address various harms. The levers of power are currently in the hands of an administration openly hostile to the most marginalized. 
The prison industrial complex abolition calls for the elimination of policing, imprisonment, and surveillance. And researcher Todd Clear writes, few people stop committing crimes because prison exists. Prisons are schools of crime. Society is shelling out for justice coming and going. Taxes pay for the cost of housing and feeding and then they convicted and then we pay again when new crimes are committed. And when the poor and people of, of color are so disproportionately impact, there can be no real justice. If our goal is not retribution, but restoration and wholeness, it only makes sense to put money into objectives like drug treatment, education, housing, counseling, and jobs before outsiders become insiders, and to consider alternatives to our incarceration, mental health courts, drug courts, community supervision, anger programs. I appreciate the impulse behind the abolition movement and support its goals. I believe as Prout's social and economic reforms are implemented, fewer people will turn to crime. I'm not completely convinced that some kind of detainment and reform policies will not be needed for some in the future. Um, Patrice, Patrice Cullors, you may be familiar with, uh, founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, offers some very interesting uh, prescriptions for people who are working in this area. And I'll just go very quickly over a few of them. Have courageous conversations. Commit to respond, not react. Say yes to imagination. Forgive actively. Commit to not harming or abusing others. Practice accountability. Embrace non-reformist reforms. Build community. Value relationships. Fight the state. So uh, in the last few slides, I have some, some more direct policy suggestions. Uh, I think a proudest policy would be rooted in both restorative and transformative justice, uh, which I, I talked about before a little bit. Education would be a priority for those in prison, as well as the opportunity for self-development through the arts and creative expression, mental health counseling. There would be no scope for privately run prisons, no opportunity for capitalists to make money off the lives of those caught up in the justice system. The needs of women would especially be attended to with zero tolerance for sexual harassment or discrimination. Capital punishment would be done away with. There would be fairness without discrimination based on race, background, education level, education level, economic status, in application of the law. This would suggest greater prosecution of financial crimes, which these days are largely overlooked. In a proudest world, drug laws and sentences would be reviewed to reflect the mostly nonviolent nature of most offenses and to redress the current racial bias in sentencing. And again, uh, encouraging alternatives to incarceration. Police policies would have to be re-examined, re zero tolerance policing done away with, and the police put to work doing what they are best at, not social work or mental health calls, but responding to crime. Alternative response systems for calls involving persons with disabilities and mental health issues could be implemented. Uh, Community-based policing, no tolerance for racism among the police, uh, mand mandatory sentencing laws, which tie judges' hands, would be done away with. The bail system would be reformed. Pre-trial detention could be done away with for most defendants. Children and youth would not be prosecuted or sentenced as adults. Prosecutorial roles would be reined in. Uh, PR Sarker recommended a common constitutional structure and a common penal code for all countries as part of an approach to global unity. A shared penal code across borders would contribute to stability on a regional level and have an impact on immigration as well. There's also a great need for better training of prison workers. Prout would encourage the cultivation of relationships by prison workers with those imprisoned, an atmosphere of collegiality, respect, and independence and solitary confinement is considered to be torture and should be discontinued. Um, more about the design and atmosphere would focus on compassionate reform. Uh, Prout's vision of society, every person 
should have the opportunity to grow and find meaning. And I think we're just about wrapping up. Of course, addressing the root causes of crime will be at the foundation of any practice policy. Creating a society free of poverty, good education and jobs for all, with a focus on compassion, mental health, spiritual outlook, will go a long way. Will go a long way toward redressing and even avoiding the ills of the current system. And I'll leave you with a quote from Prout's founder, P.R. Sarkar. Without a spiritual ideal, no social, economic, moral, cultural, or political policy or program can bring humanity to the path of peace. The sooner humanity understands this fundamental truth, the better. Thank you for your patience and your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing. And it looks like we have maybe 10 minutes, uh, 10, 11 minutes, if, if anyone would like to um, offer their thoughts, have a conversation about any of the points that I raised, uh, debate them, I, I'll open up uh, to the moderator. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent. I'm curious, um, many of us are hearing a lot of talk about defunding police or, or I think more appropriately reallocating some of the resources to some of those other kinds of interventions. Uh, have, have you given any thought to that in, in the course of your research? Um, it's not something that I focused on when I was writing the book, but I certainly support it to a degree. I think uh, priorities of the police should be uh, should be changed. And as I mentioned before, it should focus more on, on certain activities and less on others. Um, I, I don't know if I support the complete abolition of, of police or the complete defunding of police departments, but I do think we need a uh, reallocation of, of resources and priorities in the entire uh, justice system that, that would include the police department. Do you have any thoughts yourself? I know that this is a topic that, that you're quite uh, interested in, John. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think it's sort of a non-starter when people put it in the context of defunding law enforcement. I, I don't think that's a balanced approach. And, and it sort of a, invites a you know kind of a negative response from the outset. I, I think the, the reality is there are some programs around the country that have have done essentially some of the things that that you were recommending, where where they've created response groups that are trained in health, mental health, you know, uh, uh, de-escalation tactics, you know, that can be much more effective. I mean, when when society started closing down uh, mental institutions yes. and putting a lot of people on the streets with with clearly uh, uh, clear diagnosable problems. Um, you started committing law enforcement to trying to do a job they were ill-suited for, not trained for, and not really equipped to deal with. And and it's turned you know, you know, a lot of small jails, you know, community jails, et cetera, into the, the alternative warehousing of of those that really need mental help. But yes, um, yeah, that's why I was I was just really curious, you know, what your thoughts are, or, you know, to the extent you've had any interaction with people, you know, either in terms of staff in prisons or, and, or, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of restriction on how much communication you can really have with people inside facilities. But, you know, I, I think uh, Sarkar's emphasis on training it's very important because I've encountered a, a wide array of ability and uh, benevolent outlook in in prison workers. Some some are excellent, and for some, you know, they have contempt for the people that they're that they're there for, that they're there to guard. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, better quality training for for people who are working in prisons is. It's one way to go. 
Should I call people or, or? Yeah, go ahead. Feel free. Yeah, please. Uh, I think Prakash uh, had his hand up before. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, there's a very strong abolition movement in this country. And I think the defund the police tends to be um, maybe growing out of that, but because that particular slogan is easily um, attacked. Um, but if you were to look at, you know, especially I put in the link, uh, a, a link to a book called The Little Book of Race and Restorative Justice um, by Fania Davis. And she's a younger sister of Angela Davis. And for years, a racial justice activ activist and now a, uh, a restorative justice. You talked a lot about you, in your writings in the article about restorative justice as being very aligned to proud. She's looking at how to bring together the racial justice movements and the restorative justice and linking it as uh, restorative justice is about the kind of like the spiritual and the community approach. And the uh, racial justice is looking at the equity and justice. And so they're both needed. And she's been working to bring those movements together. And when, from what I can see, very aligned with proud and neo-humanist principles. So that I think a lot of their reaction to the defund the police or you know, abolishing prisons is because of propaganda against it, but also because um, many of the solutions to why we have so many people in being incarcerated is because of our economic system that doesn't provide a living wage, <laughs> that has many people who are marginalized. And so many of those people who are poor and marginalized, not getting services are not in prison. And so they can be sort of, oh, you know, you're gonna give people in prison something that that I don't get, but the real solution is the social justice that's uh, addressing everybody. Yes. So when it's, oh, we're gonna give people in prison something that we're not giving people, well, we wanted to give, our, our system is not designed to, um, to be promoting justice as the first principle, and it's but a reaction. And so we're almost like our economic system needs people to be not working, because we, you know, uh, so, so I, I'd like to interject. I, I think yeah. some other folks maybe yeah, had questions. Finish. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Prakash. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Yes, um, Lawrence. I cannot hear you. Uh, cannot hear. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. OK. Yeah, I have experience teaching uh, exercise and meditation in prisons. And I highly recommend that to anybody that wants to do something for the people locked up, you know, and they're very successful programs. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to have that uh, million hour yoga degree or anything like that to do it. It's surprisingly easy if you really love meditation and you don't have to be a master or a daughter or anything like that. You can just teach simple things. And I've been doing that and friends I know have, it's wonderful service. It helps recidivism too, that we've been talking about goes way down, I'm told too. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you're doing that work because I think any uh, technique that people who are incarcerated can can, can get a hold of to um, you know, sort of create a more stable environment for themselves, calm their minds, uh, improve their relationship with the other people around them. I, I think that's fantastic. It, it's good work. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Toppin, yes. Yeah. So since you have been working on this prison um, uh, system for quite some time, the prison reform, I mean, is this a, like a local issue, like a statewide issue, a state-based issue or the national issue? Or does it have to be uh, addressed from both ends, like a, both a state and local system? Uh, what do you think? I, I think it would be both and. I think it would be at all levels at the same time because uh, certainly national policies are going to affect certain impacts, uh, certain uh, aspects of, of all prisons. But so many prisons are are local jails or state run and and the state correctional um, uh, it's, the state correctional board uh, has so much impact on on those local and state policies. So I think it has to be all, all across the spectrum. Yes. 
So do, do you think that we need to sort of like a, uh, modify our messaging because uh, prison reform might be viewed as being soft on crime? Do you think that is a problem? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's something that I've certainly written about and thought about in the book because that is that is a very strong factor at motivating politicians. They do not want to be seen as soft on crime. And uh, we've seen it over and over again in the history of our country where you know some progressive reforms are implemented and then there comes a swing of the pendulum and and people feel, or politicians feel that they need to present a tough face on crime. Uh, it's not it's not a rational thing, you know. And I think many people under are beginning to understand that um, our society is not benefiting from this tough on crime policy. On the contrary, it's creating more problems, you know. So if you look at it rationally. Uh, to embrace a rehabilitative, more compassionate approach. It's going to save everyone a lot of money. It's going to save so much trauma and so much pain. Uh, and, and it's going to help build communities. So, uh, you know, people will think what they think, but I think we, we can present it in a way that makes sense, that it's, that no need to be, t you know, tough on crime that way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and then is that was there anyone else? No. I guess one real quick question, um, and and I know you addressed it that uh, Sarkar really emphasizes the importance of having you know really high quality people serving in judicial capacity because you need to have that sort of compassionate uh, discretion being exercised. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, Sarkar actually addresses, I, I think sort of summarizes it as there are sort of five reasons why people commit crimes. And 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 that is not in, included much in the current criminal justice system. You have, you know, the trier of fact that the jury who determines, you know, what in fact happened based on evidence and testimony. And then you have the judge who are in many cases kind of hamstrung right now with you know, mandatory sentencing and other things that prescribe what they have to do. But it, the system poorly accounts for why someone commits a crime. The fact that they did is only part of the process. And I think Sarkar really tried to emphasize you know, going that extra step about why, because that will help determine the proper uh, course of corrective or supportive action for the, the individual. Yeah, absolutely. Couple of comments and, and two quest questions, it looks like. Dada Maheshwar Ananda talks about a conversation with Dada Chidananda discussing what ideal prison would look like. Very high walls to protect society from antisocial behavior, but within those walls, gardens, nature, education on all levels, sports and culture, pets. That's that's very much, uh, thank you, Dada, very much what, what I was describing in, in my talk as well. Uh, prison should be such that even if an innocent person is sent there by mistake, he or she will not say they wasted their time. And I did quote Sarkar uh, in regard to that. I think there are two questions, Shri and Alex. Um, uh, oh, you're, you're asking what is behind this increase in women incarceration, 50% increase in incarceration for women over the last 22 years. What do you think is behind this? What's going on? Was that your question? Um, you know, I really, I really don't know. Um, and I'm going to do some re more research into that uh, because you're absolutely right. That is a, that is quite a shocking increase. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't, uh, I don't know what's behind that, but I'll, I'll look into it and maybe get back to you on that. And I think Sri Raksha did have her. And uh, oh, I wasn't sure you were seeing the questions in the chat because some people uh, couldn't, couldn't raise their hands. So. Is that all of the ones that I get? Did I get? I think so. Okay, great. I think maybe that's time then that wraps it up. Yes.